so that we can share it. Uh, all right. So um, doesn't everyone quickly introduce, we all kind of know each other, but just for clarity, why doesn't everyone, Nick, why don't you start just to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm just, okay. Um, uh, I'm Ira Bloom, town attorney. And I am Nick Bomanti. I work with Ira. Hi, I'm Kim Norton. I'm on town council. Hillary Ormond. I'm also on town council. New this year. And Steve Carl, old town council. Tucker Murphy, you know, and this is Mimi Pitt. I don't know Kim or Hillary if you know Mimi, Hi. but she works here in the selectman's office and in HR. And she does a lot of the, she does all of the FOI requests that come in and when she was out on medical leave for a while there, I was uh, panting every day that I was getting these requests, but we got through it, so. You know, um, actually, I think, actually, Mimi should be giving this, this lecture, I oh, think, your experience, Mimi. I think we're just gonna sign off and let you do this. Is that okay? Always nice to work together with you guys. Yes, yes. <laughs> Mimi has been uh, indispensable in our endeavors here in this area, okay. she's great. Truly. Yeah, and it shows in the decisions we've gotten, or a lot of them at least. So, here, here. Yeah. Yep. All right. So, take it away, gentlemen. Hey, before we start, Ira, I yeah. heard, I just heard today that the library won their FOIA case. Oh, really? About remember whether they were part of the town or yeah. not part of the yeah. town? Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's a great decision. Yeah, good. If you get a copy of it, can, you can send it over. I get a copy of it. Yeah, I think it's the last case that uh, Ted O'Hanlon argued before he went up to the bench. Yeah. Wow, that's great news. Is this right, meeting sorry. FOIAable? I'm just curious. Well, we're recording. I'm kind of joking, but I'm like, uh -huh. is this going to be on the town website? Yes. Oh, it will. Oh. Yeah. We we will edit out all these jokes and things though, so. Right. Uh, People could see that we were very serious. And no jokes, no jokes allowed. Um, all right. Well, I'll, I'll start, and um, I guess we'll keep this um, pretty informal. Steve, I've known for a long time, and Kim and Hillary, I guess not, not quite as long. So um, we'll uh, we'll just plunge in here, and because it's just a small group, I guess we could just interrupt as questions come up, uh, you know, without too many formalities. So we're going to walk through the Freedom of Information Act. That's the statute. We call it FOIA, FOIA Act, FOIA Commission, different abbreviations uh, or acronyms like that, um, and try to highlight some of the, the main points. And we'll try to also incorporate um, some of the particular questions, problems that have uh, come up in the New Canaan context. Uh, Tucker sent us a few few ideas, a few subjects, subject areas that we we can uh, try to discuss as we go through this. So, I mean, basically, uh, a little background, the, the Freedom of Information Act is a state statute. It begins at 1-200 and goes to section 241. So there's a lot in those statutes and that that's where we get the answers. There's a whole body of uh, decisions from the Freedom of Information uh, Commission that we rely on. Uh, and there's also a body of uh, cases from, from the courts that, that we, we, we look at also. So that's how we put this all together. Aha, I see someone has snuck in there in the back uh, also to get all the FOIA information. Very Hello, Kevin. Good. How are you? I'm good. How many do we have on? So we have three. Um, I had two more coming who I've just reminded, but I'm also recording it. Recording, so good, okay. We'll be able to share it with um, with everybody. So this is about legal advice. This is a public uh, information session. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the first, the first question, uh, well, it, the, the law covers public agencies. Uh, those, those agencies are subject to the law. Uh, the town council is a public agency, so we don't have to debate that too long. But the first question is what, you know, what is a public agency? And it's defined in the statute. It's, you know, it's generally, it's generally looked at as boards, commissions, uh, and, and that's, that's probably enough for our purposes right here. So your, your main boards and, and things like that are, are covered. Board of Education is also covered. Um, and so those are the, you know, the public agencies that that we 
we deal with and, and they are subject to this law. Next question, uh, and by the way, I think the outline that we prepared has been distributed, I hope, so you all have that. And I'm, I'm gonna follow this, largely this outline, and then we'll, um, you know, we'll amplify uh, and answer questions as we go along here. And Nick, feel free to, to jump in, although he'll focus certainly on, on some of the remote meetings. And Nick, you can also cover the procedures, what happens if there is a FOIA violation and and how sure. we work uh, largely with Mimi, uh, but um, you can cover that if you'd like. So um, what is a meeting? Because that becomes a critical question when we look at this. Uh, meetings are subject to the law. Meetings have to be open, certain other requirements. Uh, a meeting is a hearing or other proceeding of a public agency uh, involving a quorum of a uh, multi-member public agency. So uh, we know what some meetings are, but some, some other proceedings are, are, are in addition to the regular meetings. Um, where we run into trouble is when uh, members of a public agency have created a meeting inadvertently, such as by, in the old days, talking on a group telephone call. Nowadays, we deal with it in terms of uh, emails, back and forth, uh, one person to the other. Uh, you, you, you have created a meeting which is not open before the public, and that's a violation of the law. We're going to come back to that. Uh, your, your meetings, when you meet at the town count, uh, as the town council in the town meeting room, that's obviously a meeting and that's subject to uh, the FOIA law. Um, there is such a thing as a single member public agency. So for instance, the first selectman, Kevin, uh, is, a, is considered a single member public agency. So when Kevin, the first selectman, calls a meeting of his staff, his key advisors, or even, even someone from the town council and someone from the board of finance, um, that is not considered a meeting. Uh, he is a single member public agency. Uh, he could have a staff meeting, uh, and that's not considered a meeting, meeting subject to the act. So that's, that's an exception. Also note that a quorum of one public agency uh, who are present at uh, an event, which has been called by another public agency, uh, they have not created their own meeting. So in other words, if six or seven members of the town council decide to attend a regularly scheduled planning and zoning meeting, for instance, if you're interested in the topic and you all go, that's okay. Uh, you, you, you know, you're, you're just visitors, so to speak, at the PNZ meeting, even though you may have even, even a quorum of your own town council, you can go attending as, a, as attendees to another meeting without creating a problem. Subcommittees, this is very important because subcommittees are subject to the same freedom of information laws as the full committees. So the simple case is when say the town council appoints a subcommittee of two or three people, let's say, to perform a certain task, to look into something and report back to the entire town council. That subcommittee is subject to the same laws as the full town council. When I say same laws, there are notice requirements. The meetings have to be in public. There have to be minutes filed. Those kinds of things are, are the basic laws. Subcommittees are um, subject to the same laws. We'll get into this a little bit more as we go on here, but sometimes it's not absolutely clear that a subcommittee has been created, but it may have been. It doesn't always have to be called a subcommittee, but the, the public agency, town council, let's use that, uh, uh, can decide, can ask you know, two members uh, to go out and check something, come back and report. Uh, you don't have to use the word subcommittee. That may be a subcommittee. On the other hand, if two members of the council get up one day and one calls the other and says, hey, um, I was thinking about going to the town finance office and checking out certain numbers you want to come with me. 
That's probably not a subcommittee. Although you have to be a little careful about that because if they weren't given the charge to do that, it's just kind of two people doing something on their own. That, that's a little bit of a gray area in my, my opinion. Um, sometimes it causes a problem, but if the group, if the subcommittee has been designated to do a certain task by the primary agency, then you do have a subcommittee. I'm staring at Nick as I talk here and I'm only seeing Nick. So it's kind of disconcerting. So I feel like I'm talking to him. And he knows more about it than I do. Yeah, but is that is that the only picture I can get here? Or maybe I have to get to the... Uh... Yeah, Ira, if you click the uh, view up at the top yeah, right I, corner I, I, I button. Oh, yeah. that's much better. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. thank you. Now you got an audience. Now I got everybody. I thought maybe the rest of you had left already after five minutes. It's getting, getting kind of tedious. Um, all right, so that's committees, that's subcommittees. Be careful with subcommittees. Um, in general, uh, there is a meeting anytime a quorum of a public agency uh, convenes to discuss or act upon a matter over which it has jurisdiction, over which it has responsibility. So that's another factor to keep in mind. If you're just sort of all hanging around talking about, you know, baseball, um, that you can do because that's not within your jurisdiction. If you're, if you get together, seven of you, and you're talking about the uh, Board of Ed budget, um, you're having a meeting. And if it hasn't been noticed uh, and, and in a public place, um, then you have violated this law. Um, and by the way, that public place is important. Um, I, I used to be on a Board of Education here in Westport. I was on the Westport RTM, which is you know, the legislative body. And from time to time, we, this goes back a few years, but we would meet at someone's house. Uh, you know, come on over, sit around, have something to eat, talk about some topic that's not allowed. So that's, that's not, not a good idea. Not only is it not a good idea, you just can't do it. It needs to be uh, in, in a public place, usually the town hall, or something like that. Except yeah, caucuses. Um, Kevin's piping well, in. Uh, well, we're going to get to caucuses. Yeah, caucuses are, are an exception. Um, rem remote meetings, obviously, are, are a different situation uh, in terms of where you're actually sitting. We'll, Nick will talk about that in a few minutes. So let's 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 talk about what is not a meeting. Uh, there's there are several statutory exceptions um, to what um, what are not meetings. Uh, uh, social gatherings are not meetings. So if you're having a you know town council holiday party, that's not considered a meeting. Um, a chance meeting, obviously you meet in the store, that's not considered a meeting. Uh, so so those those are okay. Strategy um, or negotiations with respect to collective Can I just jump in for a minute there though? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I perfectly make sense to me, you know, chance meetings or what have you, but you can't, if you run into someone in the grocery store, you can't start talking about something that you're going to be, that's on the agenda for the next night or whatever, right? It's more about what you talk about. Well, um, you, you know, I, I, I think there's a difference between a planning and zoning member um, and, and a legislator. So um, we tell certainly our land use commissions, you know, never ever discuss a pending application because you're dealing with someone's property rights. That person has a right to hear it, respond to it, uh, et cetera. Um, so if somebody approaches you in, in the store uh, and you're a member of the PNZ, you just have to say, you know, politely, hopefully uh, can't talk about it. If you're a member of the council and someone, you know, wants your so views. If two council members run into each other in a store, um, can they start having a discussion or on the you know the ball field or whatever about an issue that's in front of the council or that will be in front of the council? Ira, let me make a comment. Ira, let yeah. me make a comment. The rules that apply to a 12 member town council are the same rules that apply to a how many members of the assembly are there in Hartford? Right? So there's two assembly people of different parties, you know meet in the parking lot and want to talk about something 
I think that happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 that, I, I was getting to something like that, Kevin. I, I mean, I, legislators, I think, can talk to each other. Right. Interesting. Okay. Um, because you know you, you, you're you're going to vote on on something, and you know you you can talk to constituents. And right. they say, you know, the Board of Ed budget is too high. What do you think? Or too low? And, and you're going to say something. Uh, and two members, um, can they can they talk about it privately? Um, I think they can. Uh, you know, I think you do have to decide whether it's it's a good idea or not. Uh, if you have some some thoughts, you know, you might want to share them with everybody, not just one person. Uh, and you might want everybody to hear what you have to say. You, so. You mean but you mean share them at a public meeting as opposed to yeah. sharing by email that, with everybody. All you know, all know. No, that's right. At a public meeting. That's what I mean. Right. So, I mean, so there's a, I think there's a, you know, judgment call as to whether it's, it's the best way to do it, but I don't think it violates freedom of information. Nick, what do you think about that? I, I agree. Yeah. I, I think it falls under the analysis that you were just um, alluding to about what a quorum is and, and whether that actually, whether those two that we're discussing now would constitute a subcommittee that has some sort of um, express authority to act. That those chance one-on-one -on -one conversations, that is not the case. So, so yeah, I think it's right that those two-person conversations under FOIA at least um, are legal. Okay. A political caucus uh, going back to Kevin's comment, uh, is an express exception to the meeting rule. So it's not considered a meeting. Uh, a, a political caucus is when members of the same um, political party uh, on, on a particular board meet to discuss their, their views on, on a particular issue. So that can be done. So all the Republicans can get together on the council and, and talk about issues all the Democrats can do the same thing. Um, where I think you run into trouble is when uh, non-members of the agency are brought in because that's technically not allowed. I, I know it happens, but it's not, it's not allowed. It's supposed to be members of the agency caucusing together. Uh, so when they start bringing in members of the political, uh, you know, the town committee or, or anyone, who's not a member of the, of the agency, say the town council, uh, that's when they're, they're having a problem. Similarly, um, this is called to my attention. I, I, I think, I haven't researched it, but it seems to me that if you're going to have a caucus of one party or the other, then I would think all the members of the party on the, on the agency should be, should be allowed to come to the caucus, invited if they could, um, if, if you're doing it with just some members, uh, again, I haven't researched that, but it, it, it would seem to me that, that that would not be consistent with the, uh, the reasoning behind this exception. So um, I haven't researched that, but if anyone else has any other opinion on, on that, less, less than the majority, uh, feel free to offer it. But it seems to me the, the intent would be all the Republicans would be invited to a caucus, all the Democrats would be invited to a caucus. Um, and you know, uh, Ira, on that point, though, when you think about it, in Hartford, there's a caucus room where the Republicans and the Democrats come and go, and they freely talk about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no particular meeting or no, 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 no particular convening of them. They actually, it's a caucus room. And they're allowed yeah. to go in there and meet with whoever is there. And uh, so I, well, I just kind of, again, the, the same law okay. applies to the assembly that applies to a, a local town council. So, all right. Well, I, didn't know about the room or how it operates, um, but that that just, you know, again, without doing any research, that, that that's how I looked at it initially. I mean, it, historically, historically, the council's always included everybody, and we've yeah. always had to do that. So at least for the past 15 years, I don't I don't ever remember a time where a political caucus anybody was excluded. So yeah, uh, we uh, we shouldn't have that issue. The one the one uh, exception to that is because the first selectman is an ex officio. We always viewed that position as being eligible to be invited into the, at least for now, the Republican caucus. So, is that still the case? We could still invite the first selectman in, right? Because technically, he's a he's an ex officio member of the council. Yeah, um, 
a voting it was some, right. Some, some voting right to right. vote too. Yeah. To yeah. Break and everything. So I, I would think that would be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly because of the vote. If it's a non-voting member, I don't know. Maybe there's a different argument, but but I know he first election has certain voting rights, right? So um, so I, I would think that's okay. So let's talk about emails because this is where things get trickier. Um, do, do email communications constitute uh, a meeting under FOIA? Um, the answer is they certainly can. Um, and um, what happens is if typically if there's a distribution of emails back and forth among a quorum where there's an exchange of views back and forth, then you, you have really created a, a meeting and it's an illegal meeting because it's not noticed, it's not open to the public. Um, so that's what you have to be careful of, um, particularly where there's, there's a dialogue. Um, you can certainly have administrative emails back and forth, you know, uh, we're starting early next week, so please remember that or whatever. Um, administrative things are fine. Uh, one person can, can actually write to everyone else. This happens sometimes, maybe not too often anymore, but it does happen where someone wants the others, let's say in the council to know how they're going to vote on, a, on a, an important topic and they lay it all out and they just say, just want you to see this. Um, but then they need to write at the bottom, please do not respond because once you get the responses going, you know, you're, you're very likely causing a meeting. But you can let people know how you're gonna vote, uh, you know, if you want, uh, or try to convince people with your arguments. Um, Ultimately, it's probably better to save the discussion until you're at the, in the meeting room at the council table and you make your arguments and you have your discussions so everybody hears it, including your colleagues on the council, including members of the public, and, um, and all the responses are, are right there out in public. It's, it's just, that's what the law encourages so everybody hears the same thing and it's done openly. One-on-one um, -on -one emails, probably okay. Uh, if it starts developing into, you know, up to a quorum, not okay. And if the one-on-one -on -one, uh, involves a subcommittee, uh, then it's not okay either because that subcommittee has to be doing its work in public. I've, I've heard Tom Hennick say at these sessions, he may have said it when we had it a few years back, but I've heard it several times that an email from one person, that's okay. Uh, but as soon as you get the bounce back or, you know, communication back, um, you've created a meeting. So that, that's what you have to be careful about. The key concept there, as Ira mentioned, is discussion. And that's actually the term that's used within the statutory definition of meeting. So once, I mean, we've, we've said it, but just to drive the point home, once an email, if someone wants to, for example, in Ira's example, speak their mind to the group and say, don't respond, please. Um, once that re some response comes, then it starts becoming a discussion. That type of a discussion to a quorum is a meeting. Under FOIA, it needs to be noticed, and that's where we get in trouble. So, so the next topic is um, participating by electronic means. Um, and remote meetings. So, I mean, this is this is now sort of a completely different discussion and Nick's gonna update you on, on all that in just a, a few minutes, but um, before, before COVID and before we had so many Zoom meetings, uh, there was always an issue. In fact, it occurred in New Canaan, um, I don't know when, five, six years ago, Steve and Kevin might remember, pretty sure it was the council. That there was somebody that was, away and was insisting on participating. Um, <laughs> I remember this well. Yeah, yeah Tucker, you, you were probably there and I, and I forgot who it was, but, but it was it seemed very controversial at the time. Now it seems kind of quaint, but uh, you know, was that allowed? And then as I recall, the, the, the person could participate, but maybe not vote. Yeah. Maybe it was the other way around. I don't know, it, it was a big deal. Um, certainly in recent years, you, do, you know, there are a lot of boards, commissions that have somebody who just can't make the meeting. 
So it's done electronically, uh, even, even as easy as like a cell phone, you know, in the middle of the table, um, might be hard to do with the council of that, of that size, but um, the best thing to do is to have your own internal rules as to how you want that to work. Um, this is probably becoming a little bit of a moot issue, I guess, with uh, remote remote meetings and, and all that. I mean, do you want to jump into that a little bit here, Nick, uh, instead of saving it all for the end? Or yeah, out? I mean, I, I don't know how far for purposes of today we need to get into the weeds um, because, I mean, that's what these additional legal obligations are now. It's 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 more timely notice where we're having remote meetings. Um, but but the point is, as, as I mentioned, we first started seeing remote meetings, i.e. what we're doing right now, become a thing during COVID. They became a thing legally through the governor's executive orders. Those orders have now expired, but the legislature has codified into law the um, obligations that were laid out initially under those executive orders and expanded them slightly. Um, they're not perfect, they're not entirely clear, but um, at this point, I think we have a decent framework and understanding of, of when a town body, um, when the town council wants to hold a public meeting either entirely remotely um, or with some hybrid in-person and remote access. Um, there's just a, a couple additional steps that we need to make sure are adequately taken. I mentioned getting proper notice out um, beforehand. Um, our, our agency members always have a legal right built into the law now that if, if an agency member wants to participate remotely, that is their right. And if that is a request, um, municipalities need to uh, provide for that remote uh, meeting interface and allow whoever's participating remotely, at, at least agency members, um, full voting privileges as if, and discussion rights as if they were sitting there right at the meeting. This is not an obligation on municipalities or public agencies to hold remote meetings. It is permissive. So we are allowed, if we choose to, to allow public access to our meetings remotely. So that's that's the bottom line here. I know I worked um, pretty closely with Tucker um, earlier last year to develop the town's internal policies. Um, so I don't know to what extent that's going to apply or not to this council, but um, we effectively made it what the law says we synthesize that into a document that's more, more clear. So I know the town has its own internal policies on how to facilitate and when to facilitate remote meetings. Um, and then attached to the back of your materials here is a, a, a more legalese, but it's my summary, if anyone really wants to drill down um, in bullet form as to what these additional remote meeting obligations actually are. So, I mean, I, I know we've got plenty to get through. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I think that gives us a, a sense for what this remote meeting thing is now under Connecticut law. So Nick, does that change, does it allow a, a body like the council to make their own rules as far as members, attendance, which we have in place already and remote, you know, we have what amounts to 11 regular scheduled meetings a year we take august off as far as on the books usually we meet in august anyway but there's 11 scheduled meetings that we all vote on once a year and everybody knows going into the year when those dates are mm. and i'm an in the room kind of guy and you know i don't i don't mean to be a sort of a hard hardball stance here but to me since since my career has been like, I leave vacations, I skip vacations, I, my schedule revolves around those 11 dates, no matter what. And I've moved heaven and earth to get to these meetings for the last 15 years. So to me, when, when you have an elected official that's supposed to be at those 11 meetings, I'm not talking about special meetings, I'm talking about the regularly scheduled meetings. I, I often wonder how, I think it's written where we, if you miss two of them, a year on the council, you're subject to removal. So um, how do we 
make sure that we, you know, don't have a slippery slope, I guess, where we get very casual about showing up to these meetings and we, and we sort of have six to eight people in the room and a few people on remote. And, you know, it just doesn't have the same feeling as everybody getting in the room once a month. Yeah, understood. And, and that's not the first time I, I've heard that. And, and there is certainly some sense to that. The, the direct answer is we are not going to be able to force any of, of your council members to go in person if they make the decision, hey, I want to participate remotely. Um, is, it, if, is, it, is it an individual decision, uh, Nick? Uh, in other words, if the majority of the council says we don't want a remote meeting, uh, can one person say I have a legal right and I'm, I'm going to exercise it? Yes. No is matter it, what, right? So, so you know, even if we made it a town council policy that those 11 meetings, you know, are in-person meetings where you're there, no matter what, we still couldn't, if somebody said, I can't make it for whatever reason, I want to do remote, then it goes legally, it falls to the, the law. Okay. That's yeah, that's, that's correct. And I mean, the fallback is if, if people actually start missing meetings, then I think you have some authority under your own bylaws then, and, and whatever the charter says, I'm not sure exactly, but for, for removal purposes. But yeah, I mean, that, that has been come up um, a, a number of times across the state, and this is a pretty clear um, legal right that agency members have. Okay. And I, I think, Steve, uh, <laughs> this is going to be an ongoing debate because uh, as, as we sort of move from town to town, um, you know, you're, you're an in-room guy, uh, but there are others that don't want to ever see the room again. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, and I don't want to say I, I, I'm exclusive of the folks that I yeah. love the idea that public, wherever they are, they could be at, out of the country and still tune into our meetings. I think that's great yeah. and even participate. But it, it, it's so ironic that, you know, we just built a town hall that is beautiful. We have a beautiful space, a beautiful meeting room where yeah. you, you can gather as a town. And, it, and the town council is it's built around people coming and participating. And it's, it's almost like the minute we got that room finished, we sort of said, okay, well, now you don't have to come to any meetings because you can go remote. It's, it's just it's just a slice of irony, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I don't, think right. we fill, I don't think we've filled that room up once since we've had, uh, since, I don't know, maybe some of the P&Z meetings are, are bigger, but the council hasn't had any meetings that more than like three people in the room. It's mm. wild. Yeah, well, you're right. You do have the nicest uh, meeting room in does, is, is this permanent legislation, uh, Nick, that um, is this permanent legislation? As of uh, about three weeks ago, it is now permanent. That, that makes the amends for you? Correct. No expiration date on this, right? I mean, it also is tricky in that materials that normally you would have available at the meeting obviously have to be made available to the public. I've, I've been at a... Um, I've been at several meetings where, where it's been a hybrid and someone's walked in, uh, a resident actually, with a document that they wanna hand out to all the town council members. And if some are at home or remote, you know, we're scrambling there to try to make sure that those folks have an opportunity to see whatever it is that the resident shared and anybody else that's following in on the meeting, so. Well, people don't have a right, people have a right to express public comments. They don't have a right to bring things and present them to a body, yeah. right? I mean, I, I, I think a chairman could say, I'm sorry, we're not going to accept that. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, if someone is submitting something into, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about this more in the zoning context where there's a statutory public hearing, there's a record that's being billed, um, there's, there's due process rights to submissions in, in those instances. But yeah, I mean, if, if you guys are taking a customary action that, um, I mean, sure, if the chairman feels that it's not appropriate. I, I think that decision can probably just be made. Yeah, we're, you know, we don't need to accept that. I, I don't know well, if that's the decision you necessarily want to make. Um, right. But but yeah, I mean, if, if it's something that is actually going to then be accepted and um, considered by at least a, a portion who's in person, then yeah, I mean, it's common sense. We need to get that to the rest of the attendees who are attending remotely somehow. And so logistically, council, that's not that easy. I, I recognize our council that. members, if they've ever developed something that they would like to share that they're preparing in advance of the meeting, 
they should know that if they do have something like that, I'm thinking about that capital projects uh, process form that was brought up recently. You know, if they could get that to me ahead of time so that I can make sure that everybody has it and it's available um, for the public because a council member might bring that up or has brought Yeah, and I, I mean, we can only do as good as we can do. So if someone right. submits something at a meeting right. and we, we don't have, the, the technological wherewithal to scan it in and post it on the website like immediately for whoever whatever public attendees might be um, there. I, I mean, so we post it the next day. I mean, we, we need to look at this reasonably and the law doesn't speak to that granular of a level. That's, that's what I meant when I said this isn't perfect, there are gray areas. These are, you know, these are the situations that we see arise that we, sort of need to figure out how we can practically make it work best for us while still being within these these muddy waters that are the FOIA law right now. If we're having a town council meeting and there's remote members that don't have access to the same information as in-person members, um, can a discussion take place? And number two, can a vote take place? Or is that a reason to defer till, till, they, get, till they get that information? Yeah, I mean, if, if you folks are considering something um, on your agenda and there's materials that may inform or not, um, but at least have been submitted as part of this agenda item, then yeah, I, 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 I mean, I would not suggest action until everyone has had access to those materials. And again, I'm taking this from um, what I typically do in the, the zoning context, but I mean, we need our record in, in those instances, if we're facing a court appeal, we need to make sure the decision was made by everyone with a full understanding of the complete record. So, I mean, e even though you guys aren't subject to the same legal obligations that the zoning commission is, I mean, in order to make a, a, a fully, a careful and fully considered an equitable decision, I mean, I, I would recommend, yeah, tabling it unless we're under some sort of time crunch and the rest of the folks who don't have the materials just recuse themselves or abstain. Um, well, Nick, how, is there room for uh, having rules of the, of the body? You know, the, the town council has rules and perhaps this is something that the town council could say, have a rule about the... Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, the town council does have its own bylaws that inform some of the boots on the ground procedure on how to practically and logistically make the, the town count, allow the town council to take action. So, I mean, we're always going to get a situation where we don't have a rule drawn out that's going to effectively cover it. But sure, I, I think we could make an attempt. You know, because there's currently a rule by electronic meeting, which I guess has been obviated by this uh, new law. You know, you, know, it's, uh, you, you can participate, but you can't vote um, for town council members. If you're not president. I think that derives from that incident I, I mentioned from five, six, seven years ago, where somebody wanted to participate, was away, and you know, couldn't vote, but could, could just you know, discuss the issues. Yeah, that's, that, that's correct, Ira, and, and I think we've been operating under the voting uh, on, you know, by by Zoom ever since we went into COVID protocol. I mean, we've, we've accepted votes uh, from the council yeah. Yeah. and counted them and, and made sure that they were counted correctly. So we, we, I think that's just the way it's going to be, right? That's the way we'll be operating from here on out. And state law would override any council rule we had about not being allowed to vote, right? So, Correct. Yeah. 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 Now that this has been codified, we can't we can't have a town council rule that would well over, overcome that. I mean, you can have your own rules. Uh, you know, I suppose if somebody just doesn't want to abide by the rules, then you're going to have a, a battle if they say, "Well, I'm allowed to do this under state law." But you can certainly have your own rules that encourage certain behavior and hope that. Well, that's an interesting thought, Ira, because, um, for example, I mean, some votes are, are required a minimum of seven votes, right? So that uh, people could, people could complain um, that proper form wasn't filed followed if um, if someone didn't have the proper materials to vote on, and, and uh, you didn't have seven valid votes. So I, I just I, th I think there's room for rules. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think you can come up, up with your own rules. Most people I think would abide by them. Yeah. You might get someone occasionally, they'll say, well, I'm sorry, I'm gonna you know, exercise my rights under state law to do something else. And then, and then you have a question of which, which prevails. But yeah. um, I don't think you've lost the ability to have your own operating rules so that, so that there's some consistency in how people react. Um, so, but I do think this in-person versus remote is, is gonna be an ongoing issue because there are clearly distinct views that individuals have about what they wanna do. Some of it is COVID driven still. Some people still don't wanna go into a room. Um, but I think some of it, some people say, hey, you know, this, this has been fine and it's a lot more relaxing to stay at home and that's what I wanna do. And I think it's gonna be an ongoing debate. I, I've just seen it, you know, really starting now. Um, some towns insisting that people come back to the meeting room. Uh, other towns don't seem to care. Certain boards want, certain boards don't want. Certain individuals disagree too. So um, stay tuned. We'll see how it all kind of sorts out. But it, it's going to be a discussion item. So let's let's try to zip through some other topics um, if we can here. And, um, After they had the executive session. Ira, can we uh, handle? Can we go into social media a little bit too? Yeah, yeah. What, what you want to skip to, let me just see what I had here. Types of meetings, this is not critical. You got regular, special, and emergency. Uh, your regular, the ones you talked about, Steve, 11 meetings set at the beginning of the year. Special meetings, you can set up with 20, 24 hours notice. You cannot add to a special meeting agenda. You can to a regular meeting agenda. Emergency meetings are few and far between, but they can be set up too. Um, I think we've talked a little bit about quorum. We'll, we'll get to social media in just a couple of minutes. Uh, basically, if you have less than the quorum, you're, you're okay in terms of FOIA. I mean, that's a, that's a, a sort of a general statement, except it doesn't always hold because if you have less than the quorum, do you have a subcommittee? Um, we once had a problem in town over, over subcommittees that we didn't think were subcommittees, but they really were subcommittees. So. Uh, even less than a quorum can be a problem uh, if it's any sort of sub subcommittee type thing. But can I ask uh, a question: Is it is yeah. a quorum a simple majority? That's seven out of twelve for yeah. the town council. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have two or three or four people meeting and they're just having coffee and they're just talking about something, uh, that's less than a quorum probably okay now. Uh, we've cited the most recent case from 2021 here. Um, unless that group has some sort of express authority from the agency to do something or discuss something. So you do have to be careful about it. You can look over these cases. Um, just very quickly on executive sessions. I, I don't think we have too, too many executive sessions with the town council, but um, they come up. Uh, and they could come up about uh, for pending litigation. They could come up over certain appointments or employment issues, performance evaluations, except you do have to notify the employee if you're talking about a particular employee and that employee has the option to have the meeting in public. Security issues can be discussed in executive session. Um, discussion of the selection of a site uh, that the town may want to purchase or lease uh, because if you had the discussion in public, it could affect the price. So that could be done in executive session. So those are some of the main um, reasons for executive session. To go into executive session, you have to vote in public. You do not vote in executive session. You have to come out of executive session and go back into public session to actually vote. Uh, so that's that's an important point there. All right, well, there's a few other things, but let, let's let's jump to um, talk about social media. Actually, Ira, before Go they ahead. leave, there do, do they still print this little? Uh, I guess this came out in 2010. Do they still that little handout thing? Yeah. Yeah, 
I, I don't know if they still print it, but I, I don't know. I see them around. Yeah, so Here this the, this is a pretty good uh, sort of, a, yeah. at least for new people, it's a great pocket little uh, thing to carry around. I, I think, actually, Claudia, Claudia got some. Did, yeah. did Claudia, do you guys remember getting one of these from Claudia? Ken, do you, do you remember seeing that? We never that? got one, but I would I would love to have one. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's it's a nice. Uh, if Claudia has more of these, we should pass them around. Cut her. These are these are really good. I'll check them. So okay. the issue of social media is you know <laughs> complicated, um, and again, I, I think there's a little bit of a different view uh, between land use boards which are dealing with individual property rights and there's the, there's a you know due process component to this in addition to freedom of information and legislative bodies uh, so I think there's a slight difference I, I would always tell members of the PNZ let's say ZBA wetlands um, do not comment on social media on, on anything that is or could be, uh, before you, certainly not in any pending application or soon to be pending application uh, because it could show some predetermination, it could show some bias and that could cause a problem for the whole process. So it, it's a pretty black and white rule, I think, for land use bodies. Uh, it, it, it may be a little different for legislative bodies such as the town council, the RTMs, um, things of that nature in terms of, of commenting, um, you know, your, your legislators, your representatives of the people. Uh, so I don't know that there's the same strict rule. However, you could fall into the trap of creating a meeting if a certain number of people start having a dialogue back and forth. So it does have some similar problems as with the emails. One person can post something, another member of the council responds, and before you know it, you have all the members, or the majority of the members of the town council participating on social media. Uh, you may have just created an illegal meeting. So that's one risk. Uh, you know, there's a policy determination of whether that's the best way to debate the issues. Um, can everybody access the site? Um, do, are all your colleagues aware of your position. Uh, so sometimes it seems best to hold off and articulate your position when you're sitting at the town council table in the meeting room. Uh, so that's another way to look at it, but that's not necessarily legal. That's more of a policy standpoint. Um, so I had a question, Ira, with the, you said something about every, does everyone have access to the information? So on social media, there's closed groups, open yep. groups, you know, whether that it could be on any forum. So if something is discussed by someone on the council when the public does not have full access to that or other town council members may not have full access to that, is that considered okay? Well, okay might be different than is it legal, <laughs> you know? Okay, that's, I guess I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so is it yeah. legal? Not if a few a quorum of town council members jump into that same chat room and start going back and forth with, well, you know, I, I think this. Um, well, what about this? It, it 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 goes to what we talked about before. Is it a meeting? And it becomes that triggers a meeting. a meeting. But then right. there's the question of the open meeting law, which is in like again, I'm not an attorney, but that the public should have full access to the opinions of people on town council if it's being um shared with a limited group right so right. i mean fo follow that train of thought if it's a meeting that the public is excluded from that's the issue right so that that's then it's illegal then it's right. illegal and it just should not take place can we can right. we, do, that's can we do the actual facts here because this is about me so i'll just no, it's I'll not just hillary it is it's, it's, it actually no. is so, no, it's, I don't think that it is. I mean, I'm gonna. Okay. I just want to say one thing. I'm interested in just knowing for myself because I'm in different Facebook groups okay. and things like that. So to me, it sounds like if you're not triggering a meeting, it's very unlikely that seven of us are going to be on the same closed group. If you're right. not triggering a meeting, then anything's fair game. It sounds like even if members of the public do not have access 
to say my opinion if I put it on social media in a separate group, not, not the group that we're talking about, Hillary, right? So that that's one of the things that just concerned me. There's 19,000 people. About the, okay, go ahead. There's 19,000 people in the town. If I went onto a site with 100 women and I put my opinion in, but the other, you know, 18,900 people in town did sure. not see that, is that legal? Different from triggering a meeting. That's a different, it's a different issue. I think it uh, is I'm, under FOIA. Yeah, I'm hard pressed to say it's illegal. Um, or if you, yeah, or if you're just I mean, providing it, it, information. I don't think it, I don't think it violates the Freedom of Information Act, just one person as a legislator uh, expressing his or her opinion on, on some, some site. I mean, you know, a generation ago would be, it would be the same thing if you were in the grocery store and telling three people what you thought. Uh, not everyone hears that. Um, you can do that. Or hosting a coffee. Or right. hosting your coffee or anything else. Um, if you were in the land use biz, um, I, I think it doesn't necessarily violate FOIA, but it, it could very easily violate the property owner's due process rights. I know this is you're not you're not on the PNC. No. None, none of you are not talking to PNC. I realize that, but I'm just by contrast saying you know uh, if you're talking about someone's application for a subdivision. Sure then you're, you're violating that person's rights if you don't say it directly to them so they can respond. That's my my bigger concern on something like this, and Hillary, it's nothing to do with you, it's something else that's happening right now, is I'm more concerned about the accuracy of information. Sure. It's one thing to, it's one thing to um, share your opinion, um, but then it's the accuracy of the information from which if it's inaccurate, then then there's the whole undoing of the inaccuracy um, piece that becomes a burden. Yeah, and I mean, I'll be clear. It, I think you have to be careful, and I've been very careful not to share my opinion. I've been very careful to solicit and to give information. I've said, we're having a meeting to a group of 4,500 people in our town. Right. Here's when a meeting is, and it's been posted on town. Is that illegal? I can't imagine that that's illegal, sharing that information. I've said, so. I've said yeah. in a Facebook post, People from town, like town council and board of finance wants to know if we want a movie theater. If you want a movie theater, email these people. And then people have commented. I've not responded with my opinion. I've been very agnostic about it. That's, that's exactly the point is that you have it. And that's, that's the right thing to do. You put the yeah. information out there about when the meeting is, but then the, I always call it the pile on on social media, right? Then yeah. everybody else comes on with all their opinions. And now let's say somebody throws something out there that's completely right. inaccurate. Do you then step in since you started the post and say, yeah, that's an, I mean, I, that's where I, I have. And I have corrected. Like if somebody has said we shouldn't, we shouldn't ban for instance, leaf blowers. I've said, everything's on the table. Mm -hmm. We're just, we're at an information gathering stage and it could be a ban, which is highly unlikely. And it could be us doing nothing, which right. is probably unlikely too, but whatever, it's a gradual thing. And we're just gathering information, which to me is like very sterile and vanilla. It might right. not be to anybody else. But it's true. We're just gathering information at this point. Um, so you, yeah, I get it. It's you try to, but I don't see the difference between a social media. Okay, this is my other son, James. Um, he's interrupting us. He's Stellan's twin brother. Um, uh, I was going to say, uh, I saw a resemblance there. Yeah, no, I agree with you. But I think in terms of FOIA and, or whether it's a legal meeting or, or not, you know, you could have the same thing happen again at like a forum, at a legislative forum or at a coffee that somebody hosts, which I know other people on town council have held coffees at like Le Pen. It's just that we're in a different world now, right? Where, where people do have these information and you get really good feedback sometimes in these groups from a big cross section of the town, which I find sort of invaluable. I wouldn't wanna lose that because we're afraid of sharing information or soliciting information as long as we're doing it properly. So if if the way that it's being framed is improper, that's certainly something I wanna know, but I've tried to be, when I've done those two posts, I've tried to be as information giving and neutral as possible in doing so. And if you don't think I, don't I have, if, and, you know. I don't know if this is legal or not, um, but I mean, I guess my issue with it is that people do chime in without having the facts. And it tends to create sometimes a downward spiral where people will then believe false information and then continue to comment on something because it's not a public meeting. Like if 
if I saw some of the comments I might, and I was in a public meeting, I might chime in and say, well, did you read the presentation? Did you see this or, you know, but if there's no intervention and it's just kind of people going off on a tangent, I think that can affect the legislative process in a negative way because it's not public, it's not based on real information. And that's my concern. I don't think it's necessarily a legal concern. I think it's more just my concern in general of people going off on things. And then when Tucker says, if you if, if misinformation is put in there, then it makes it even worse, right? Yeah. Like someone unintentionally puts in information that they didn't know was wrong, then people go down and then people start talking about it. And then all of a sudden, what was you know more of a neutral topic turns into something very negative. So that's just oh. my, that's why I don't comment on social media. I mean, yeah. I have had a coffee at La Pan, full disclosure, and I was told by Claudia Weber that was okay if I listened and I did not give it my opinion. So I did that to solicit information from people and I did not give my opinion, nor did I talk about the council. Um, but part of my What's platform was coffee with a councilwoman, you know, and how is it different? Uh, it's not, it's not on the internet for people to read and Honestly, it was Even not worse. negative. It was not negative. It was not well, negative. No one was going off on a tangent saying, you know, it, I was just asking people's opinions. I wasn't making any announcements like, oh, we're going to do a leaf blower ordinance. How do people feel about that? But why you know, is I, that I, bad I, I to tell people to what's happening? Why is sharing information a bad thing? Why don't we want people to know? People are going to talk about and share misinformation, whether you put it on the internet it's or on not. the town website. It's already on the town website. Okay, so Kim. I don't understand. I'm, I'm all about that. getting information from people and to hear from people. And if you're not, that's cool. I mean, it, I think legally well, we've I, already I, I, answered. So Hillary, that's not, yeah, a, that's, yeah, not that's, a fair, that's not a fair right. claim to make. We can talk that about, about this offline. Giving, this doesn't I'm not about it's giving not, information to people. That's completely so, not true. If it's not, just that I think it should be given to people. This, this is. This is, we can make we, a rule about we it. We answered the legal question and, and yeah. look, uh, as, as legislators, uh, yeah. I mean, we can, I think you, you do have a right to express your opinion. I, I'm not going to say you don't because that's, that's, that's your job. But, you know, from my personal standpoint, uh, elected officials also have responsibility to make sure the information is, is as accurate as can be. Sure. But this is the world we live in now, and it's 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 not only New Canaan; it's the whole country and social media and information that's less than accurate, and then people rely on it and, and all that. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but yeah, um, I don't think anybody does. Just, for, just in terms of this FOIA law, uh, you're, you're not you're not violating the law, except be careful about the meeting thing, and strive for you know accuracy is what I would say. That's not. That's not written in the law, but uh, I think that's probably a good a good policy. Keep it as accurate. Make sure it's accurate. If someone puts something that's not accurate, wrong numbers, wrong facts, whatever, I, I hope somebody tries to clear it up. Ira, what about um, under the town council rules? I mean, is there is there uh, have you ever heard of any of the legislative bodies having uh, social media? Um, guidelines under their under their um, rules i mean we haven't done that yet but yeah at some point we'll probably I've, have to do that but yeah i have not seen that i've not seen any formal rules um i suspect a lot of people would resist that yeah well I, no and, and, I, and i'm actually i'm all about and i agree with hillary in terms of having the reach of some of our local uh social media i mean there are very few towns that have a thing like Nikina Moms, which is amazing, where you're reaching a tremendous a number of folks in one spot. Yeah, uh, no, but, yeah, there's Westport Moms too, you know, all yeah. this stuff out there. But the, uh, you know, the, the pluses and minuses, it really gets to be, you know, I know they've wanted to keep that site anti-political. So, you know, I think it's information as Hillary said, hey, it's, we're going to be voting on this. So stay tuned type of thing, just an announcement more than a back and forth. But, but um, the, the way the sites are set up, Steve, is if commenting is allowed, then there's no way to police that, right? So if you had yeah. your own site, like one of the town council members says their own site, they put out information, they can turn off commenting. But on a site like that's not run by one of us, we have no control over what happens after the announcement is made, right? And then if people devolve into a conversation based on non-factual information, only because they don't have it, then it, it tends to, I think, affect the legislative process in a negative way. What, what's also toxic, in my opinion, 
just to amplify on this is when uh, some of the commentary, I'm not talking about anything, anybody here, but in general, I've seen enough of it myself, um, gets personal questions, the, the motives uh, of certain people, accuses them of you know, improper actions or illegal things, whatever, I've seen that. I've seen it addressed to, to me, to others, I mean, to elected officials. And that's when you know, the whole system kind of breaks down. Uh, so um, I don't have the answers to those things. I just don't know. It's a problem nationally. It's a problem in New Canaan, I'm sure, to some level, in Westport, every town around here. Um, so, um, All right, I don't want to get done, but I, along these lines, you know, um, rules regarding text messaging. I mean, it's just another form of communication. Yeah, yeah and, it is. Um, yeah. It, it's again, in the same a, category it's about a discussion i mean you can't have a discussion via text right no you can't uh and you'll see in the outline material that there's a draft uh, right. FOIA opinion on this it never got finalized for different reasons but um texts are in the same category as emails basically uh and um we get we, FOIA we get, all the time for them and they're hard to search i mean i just routinely just delete my texts in general, yeah. just my normal, you know, texting that I have with friends and family, but I could see how it would be hard to retrieve something after the fact if it's not there. People, sometimes, yeah, people do delete those things. You, you should not, by the way, delete any town business emails. Those should be saved. Um, but people have a tendency to delete texts uh, there are requests for for voicemails too, and, and yeah. uh, you know I clean I clean mine off as I go. I just I so listen to full, it, right? and I just yeah, it'll get full. And the same on your phone too. You don't want to get to the point where the worst thing is you call someone and they say you know the voicemail is, is full. Truly, so right. I find it very annoying. So delete delete those so I can leave you a message. But if you delete them, then you can't produce them. Uh, I think the voicemails are considered transitory, so. Uh, there's no problem in doing that. Oh. Um, Excuse me, I have to leave, Tucker. I was going to um, join from my phone with my video off, so I'm going to leave. Could you let me in on my phone? Sure. And Sorry, thank you so much. Longer, I appreciate it. Sure. We won't go thank that you. much longer, but yes, yeah, feel free to join. I'll let you back in. Um, okay. So, um, I don't know how much time we have left or- yeah, I thought we were gonna do like an hour. So I guess, uh, let me just let her back So in. is there anything else here that, uh, let's see, that's really critical to go over. Or uh, Hillary or, or Steve or now Kim, do you guys have any specific questions of things that we haven't covered? I was also thinking that this is probably gonna spur on some questions that you all might have in thinking this through. So if you do have any further questions after today, feel free to send them to me and then I can get Nick and, and Ira to respond. Um, if you think of something along the way, but didn't know for you know, one better thing, yet, pick up I, I, I do want to emphasize that um, I'm, I'm almost positive, Mimi, you can tell me, but I, I think I know the answer. Everybody, certainly everybody on the council has a town provided email address, they correct? Do. Yes, they do. And you should absolutely use that for any town business without exceptions. Um, mostly because then it's saved and we can access it and we could find it. Uh, if you use your own personal email, uh, that is subject to disclosure under the FOIA laws, but that forces you to go back in most cases and go through your own emails and sort it out between personal and town related stuff and it's a headache. So use the town. Myra, um, on this tourism and economic development advisory committee that I hope that I chair, mm -hmm. um, we don't have town emails. I guess they're hundred dollars each and there's just some, some committees that yeah. aren't giving them. So what I recommended to everybody to do, I hope this is accurate, but they set up a separate Gmail account mm -hmm. just for that yeah. committee. Yeah. And Absolutely. That one so that they don't call me. Yeah. That's exactly, yes, that's exactly what, what they should do. Okay. If they don't have a town one, then isolate it from all your personal stuff, certainly from your business stuff. Uh, sure. we, could, we could probably spend a lot of time talking about stories of people using their business email meeting, right? Uh, right. But we won't get into that today. What's um, the most it, common most innocent sort of mistake that we all might make with, with regard to FOIA that um, it's just something that we can just, you know, just ingrain into our brain, but just never do that. Is it just the, the reply all feature or, or aspect of, of doing business? Is that something that gets everyone into the most trouble? I mean, what do you see? Well, um, 
it, it has, surely it's in the email category uh, okay. in terms of um, sending out emails, creating possible meetings, putting things into emails that you're, you're sorry to read later. Um, jokes are not, do not sound good in emails when you read them later. It never sounds terribly funny. It sounds like you might be insulting somebody. So I tell people, don't put any jokes. Right. Don't, don't put any personal comments. Stick to the people. facts, ma'am. Stick to the facts. Stick right? to the facts, ma'am, is right. Don't say, oh, this guy was a clown from, from the beginning. Don't ever say things like that, even if you mean it as a joke. Um, so I just know, be, I be careful what to go say. And this, I sound like a broken record, but you know, 15, 20 years ago, we didn't have email. We picked up the phone. Yeah. So I think if you have something really sensitive or whatever that you, you feel you need to discuss, don't, I, I would not put it in an email. I, I mean, I think my rule of thumb for me personally is every single thing I write, I mean, I think this is just good, you know, um, sort of moral compass for me, but it's just, I write everything with the full awareness that everybody could read it. How, how would I feel if somebody read this? You know, how, how would that? Yeah, As, uh, right. Assume that others will read. Right. right. I mean, we, Mimi tells me there are some communities where everyone's emails are open all the time. There's none of this searching because anybody could get into our emails at any given time. I don't know if that's the answer, but um, I think that's certainly everyone. No one should ever write an email thinking that it's private unless it's privileged, you know, uh, legal opinion, things like that. Right, but that gets into a whole different nuanced analysis, right? So right. I think your baseline, just operate as if it's gonna get read um, is a good one. And, and I have one more question on the uh, remote meeting piece, um, Nick. I've been practiced uh, just turning off chats. My The way I see the chat in a town council uh, meeting per se is, the equivalent of somebody standing up in the middle of the room and just starting to talk while the meeting's going on. If someone's chatting and people are, so I just disable it from the beginning, right? That's perfectly acceptable. We don't have to allow the chatting to go on with anybody, correct? I completely agree. Okay. I've gotten a couple of times people have called me out on that. Why is the chat disabled? And I've said, because you, you can't be standing up here having a meeting while the town council is having a meeting. Take it out in the hall if you want or call someone or do whatever, but you can't just yeah, no, I, I think your analogy that you draw is a fair one. There's no mechanism in person beyond just standing up and starting to speak your mind that's analogous to a chat room function right. in you know, a Zoom meeting. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't think we're obligated to provide that. We need to provide people attending remotely with the same opportunities to participate as if they're in person. So right. if that person wants to get up and wait in line and speak and make public comment if, if it's even authorized right. by the public agency then they can do that just like everybody else right there's one um the outline covers some things like minutes and filing minutes but you know we probably know that uh between tucker and steve so you can just read that and, and the only other area steve is uh about meetings and and how to conduct meetings and what happens if you have somebody who won't sit down and won't be quiet uh, things like that, but you've been on the council for a while, you've probably seen that happen here or there. And so um, that that's that's another component here that we sometimes cover. There are some people who just won't stop. They're unruly. Uh, you know, you, you can bang the gavel and tell them to sit down. If they don't, you can adjourn the meeting. Uh, and in some very extraordinary cases, uh, you do have to call the police. And, and I've seen that you know, in yeah. very infrequently, but I have seen it three or four times over the years. Right. Uh, so, um, yeah, luckily we don't have a community like that, uh, but yeah. you, never, you never know. The Zoom bombing yeah. was a challenge though. I mean, that, that has been in a while, but that was a real challenge to manage behind the scenes. Um, and that's very upsetting. Someone yeah. Someone yeah. gets thrown out there. So. That was, that was early on. We had an awful experience uh, with Linda on, oh my gosh, it was so yeah. bad. Yeah, that was and terrible. And in January, I was just watching over our public information session on the cell tower proposal and we got Zoom bombed. Now that had such a wide net that it drew in some people that weren't necessarily here, but um, that's just 
for me, when I'm sitting back in the room, you know, running the Zoom and I see that going on and you can't, it's like walking on, you can't hit them fast enough to mute them. It's just, yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right, Tucker. I mean, to make these remote meeting obligations work um, and avoid and, and effectuate the authority that the law gives us, which I just mentioned, the ability to essentially boot somebody out of a meeting for being disruptive. Right. That's going to take some technological wherewithal on your end. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the logistics of it, again, are, are not the easiest. Um, All right. Well, um, oh, yeah. Thank I, you, Jen. I think this was great. Um, I, what I'm going to do is share this with the entire council and some others. Um, again, and I'll ask anybody, again, if they have questions, certainly Kim, Hillary, Steve. Give any um, follow-up questions, but um, Ira and Nick, it's really helpful, and I think we can all use the refresher from now. On. I mean, it look, look, it's changing all the time, right? So um, this was helpful for me anyway. Happy to help. Great. Well, thank you all. Yeah, that's this is good and uh, good questions. And if anyone else who listens to the tape has other comments or questions, you know, they could just contact us too. Just okay. give out emails or phone numbers. Okay, great. Uh, Ira, thank you for thank the. Thank you uh, so uh, much. Okay, thank, thank you. Much. Steve, Thanks. Kim and Hillary also, and Mimi and Tucker, thank you. I'm not going to stop telling jokes, though, Ira. I refuse. <laughs> just, don't, just don't put them in the emails. Right. Tell, them, tell them at the meeting. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody.